Hey everyone, my name is Carlos and I'm here with Fernando and today we'll be sharing our policy brief on sugar sweetened beverage taxes and how we can build a better sugary beverage tax system. Berkeley, California was the first city in the United States to adopt a sugar sweetened beverage tax. The apparent effectiveness of this sugary beverage tax prompted other cities and counties around the United States to adopt the same. So why is there a sugary beverage tax? The rising obesity rate in the United States prompted the implementation of this tax. Uh, the contemporary obesity epidemic is seen to be fueled partly by the intake of sugary beverages, it's believed so. And although uh, sugar sweetened beverages are now being implemented in some parts of the United States, uh, they are unoptimized and ineffective as a method to combat obesity rates and overall improve health. The purpose of this policy brief is to review the current soda tax system, examine current evidence of the effectiveness of a beverage tax in reducing sugary beverages, purchases and consumption and public health as well, and to suggest policy solutions to improve current soda taxes. Uh, many states and their counties have applied to uh, their own excise taxes on several goods such as cannabis, tobacco products, and alcoholic beverages. Uh, though a state may implement a levy on sugary drinks, uh, no states have taken the initiatives to uh, initialize uh, this policy. However, as influence of Berkeley's perceived success of their uh, sugary beverage tax, uh, which began in 2015, uh, many other nearby cities and in other states have begun to implement similar policies. In addition to Berkeley, the city of Albany, uh, Oakland, and San Francisco have adopted the same uh, sugary beverage uh, levy uh, within their city systems. Other local governments in the United States uh, also took influence from this policy, uh, which include Boulder, Colorado, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Seattle, Washington, and Cook County, Illinois. Uh, though these cities uh, range in different tax rates, they all share uh, the same tax strategy, uh, taxation per beverage uh, volume. Uh, the ratio of this tax can vary from uh, one cent per ounce of drink volume, such as uh, cities in the Bay Area of California, to as high as two cents per ounce of drink volume, uh, such as in Boulder, Colorado. And unfortunately, this is the design weakness of the tax. Uh, currently, the tax beverages vary in each jurisdiction uh, participating. However, uh, some implementations may include artificially sweetened and low sugar beverage options to be taxed, such as um, drinks like diet soda, iced teas, and sugar, uh, zero sugar sports drinks. Additionally, uh, fruit juices that are naturally high in sugar are not taxed in this policy. Although uh, regulating all drinks at the same tax discourages soft drink consumption, uh, the current policy does not persuade consumers to switch to less uh, sugary beverages. And uh, here I have a table with um, different uh, cities and different jurisdictions. Uh, for example, we have Berkeley, California, which is um, one cent per ounce of drink volume. And this goes the same to Albany, California, Oakland, California, and San Francisco, California, which all stand at one cent per ounce of drink volume. Um, and as for Boulder, Colorado, it's at two cent uh, per ounce of drink volume. Uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania is at 1.5 cents uh, per ounce of drink volume, and Seattle is at 1.75 cents uh, per ounce of drink of volume. And uh, these are all in effect as of 2018. And there we have on the right side the year uh, the tax went into effect. And now I will be passing this on to Fernando. So we will now look at the effects and outcomes of sugary sweetened beverage taxes. 
So there is much evidence that sugary sweetened beverage taxes do have an effect on sugary beverage purchases in the jurisdiction where the policy has been implemented. So when you're following the nation's first excise tax on sugary beverages in Berkeley, California, um, Silver et al. conducted a study which examined um, whether Berkeley's um, sugar, sugary sweetened beverage tax had a significant effect on beverage sales and whether beverage consumption changed. So it was found that sales of tax sugary beverages fell by 9.6%, a significant decline of the general population that resides in this jurisdiction. However, looking at dietary intake surveys, they did not find any significant decrease in mean calories from sugary sweetened beverages. Um, additionally, Powell and Leiter conducted a study to assess the impact of Seattle's um, sugary sweetened beverage tax on beverage prices and volume sold. So this study, in contrast to Silver et al, also evaluated the overall volume sold of tax beverages two miles away from the jurisdiction's border to observe whether any consumers would cross border shop to avoid the tax. So the results of the study found that the following implementation, following the implementation of Seattle's beverage tax, the volume sold of sugary drinks actually decreased by a significant amount of 22%. Furthermore, there was no evidence of cross-border purchasing as a result of the tax. So though sugary beverage taxes may have an effect on sugary beverage purchases, sugary beverage taxes may have an insignificant effect in sugary beverage consumption. So the study previously mentioned conducted by Silver et al. concluded that um, beverage lower consumptions in response to the tax was insignificant. Um, this is partially due to some limitations as Berkeley's inhabitants um, natural low has a, have a natural low consumption of sugary beverages even well before the tax was established. Now, this lack of evidence had persuaded scholars at Drexel University, Pennsylvania, to conduct a study evaluating beverage consumption in Philadelphia um, one year after the implementation of their sugary sweetened beverage tax began on the general population. Now, the impact of the beverage tax, however, was much less than what experts predicted, actually, as there was no sig significant influence of the tax on the general population's consumption of sugar sweetened and diet beverages. So overall, future research should look at whether the tax um, impact differs in um, not only the general population, but also specific vulnerable subpopulations. So taxing sugary beverages provides a great revenue stream for local and state governments. Um, the revenue range depends on each locality's population count. Um, for example, in Berkeley, the beverage tax has generated $1.5 billion per year. Now, furthermore, in the fiscal year of 2021, $68.5 million of beverage tax revenue has been generated in Philadelphia alone. Now, the revenue generated from these taxes are more than enough to invest in public health initiatives and interventions to further improve community health, as the whole point of the policy is to improve public health. Now, despite increasing evidence that beverage taxes lower sales of sugary drinks, there has been little um, concrete evidence that the levies have desired health outcomes. So individuals may feel inclined to purchase non-tax sugary beverages, even such as fruit juice. Now, if the main objective of the tax is to enhance public health by cutting sugar intake, um, the government, uh, whether it be local, state, or national, might consider um, levying the amount of sugar in beverages rather than the volume of beverages. So sugar taxes may convince customers to choose lower sugar goods and may even compel manufacturers, wholesales, and mom and pop shops to stock and sell more healthy alternatives. So an ideal solution would be to tie beverage deliveries to sugar content rather than volume, what is, which is currently um, implemented right now. So current, um, currently beverage tax policy is focused on volume of the beverage instead of the sugar. And a tax on the beverage's sugar content, such as a cent per gram of sugar, will incentivize consumers to choose low sugar goods as high sugar beverages will be taxed much more compared to low or no sugar drinks. So research has shown the potential of this alternative tax form as um, Jean et al. in 2014 investigated the impact of charging sugar-sweetened drinks by calories versus ounces on beverage demand. 
Now they discovered that charging sugar content reduced sugar intake by 8% more while imposing a 5% lower burden on consumers than taxing beverage volume. In terms of the cost put on consumers, taxing sugar content achieves greater sugar reduction than a volume tax. So now listed on this table, um, you may find a list of sugar sweetened beverages. And according to current sugar sweetened beverage taxes, all of these are eligible to be taxed. Now, the problem with this tax tactic is that it does not incentivize consumers to choose low sugar option, as every one of these sugars, every one of these drinks are taxed um, equally per volume and not per sugar. For instance, in Philadelphia, um, no calorie sports drinks and diet sodas are also taxed in the beverage policy. And I just reinforce this does not allow consumers to choose beverages case on sugar content just only on price. And as mentioned before, this may persuade consumers to buy non-tax beverages such as high sugar juices instead of bottled water as um, these are as water cannot be easily affordable at times and provide a lower bargain power when it comes to juice in general. So now this table provides an example of a sugary drink tax. So um, in the graph, there's one based on volume and one based on sugar content. So regarding volume taxes, a can of cola will be taxed less when compared to a bottle of lemon tea, even though we all know that Coca-Cola has a much less sugar. However, if we choose to tax by sugar content instead of comparing a 28 ounce bottle of a sports drink and a 20 ounce bottle of a lemon soda, the soda will be taxed higher as obviously it contains a much higher amount of sugar. So this will, like how we further say, will incentivize people to choose low sugar options instead of finding alternative means um, to find something that's taxed lower, such as fruit juice that could be high in sugar as well. So Carlos and I have proposed three alternative beverage tax systems, and they go as follow. So a sugar per gram tax system, a sugar threshold tax system, and a multi-tier sugar tax system. And this is how we propose the levy rate should apply. So for the first, um, just a simple three cents per teaspoon of sugar. Now for the threshold, um, we can apply at 1.5 cents per ounce if sugar is equal or greater than 15 grams, so just a single threshold. And now for the multi-tier um, sugar tax system, we propose um, three tiers, um, one being zero, tier one, and tier two. So um, less than three eighths a teaspoon of sugar per ounce will lead to no levies or no charge or taxation. Tier one will be implemented by 0 0.8 cents per ounce if sugar equals to three eighths to three fifths of teaspoons of sugar per ounce. And tier two will be one cent per ounce if sugar is more than three fifths of a teaspoon per ounce. Now, with these varying um, alter policy alternatives, um, we do have different complexities. Um, for instance, the one currently imposed right now, um, the one currently applied right now, um, it's very easy since we're just focusing on, on beverage volume instead of its content. Um, beverage volume is very easily, um, it's information that's easily accessible as, a, as all products need to follow the, U, the, the, guide, uh, the national guidelines on labeling the product, and that does include um, beverage volume. Now, when we go to sugar per gram, um, this could also be feasible since information is commonly tracked on products and this could be easily verified. However, when we look at sugar threshold or multi-tier sugar tax system, um, it, it becomes a little bit more difficult as the information is not readily available and requires um, additional resources to track that information down. So there are some examples of these implementations. Um, for instance, the sugar threshold tax system. Um, in the country Hungary, beverages are taxed if sugar exceeds 8 grams per 100 milliliter. And in their currency, it's 200 HUF um, per liter. Now, the multi-tier sugar tax system, um, the United Kingdom actually uses this specific um, um, system. And it also consists of three tiers. Um, there's a high tier, there's a low tier, and then there's the no tier. So drinks that contain less than five grams of sugar per 100 milliliters um, are not taxed and they're exempt. Um, the low tier is where, whereas beverages containing greater than five grams or eight grams of sugar per 100 milliliter are taxed at 0.18 euros per liter. Now at the high tier, eight grams of sugar per 100 milliliter are taxed at 0.24 euros per liter. And Carlos. 
So through the volume based um, sugar sweetened beverages, uh, taxes may have an effect on sugary uh, beverage purchases. Uh, volume based sugar sweetened beverage taxes uh, may have insignificant effect in sugary beverage consumption. Um, a sugar based tax is most likely to be the most effective because the intention of this tax is to improve health outcomes. Uh, this tax proposal is not intended to be a simple volume-based tax, but rather to encourage consumer behavior change. Um, a sugar-based tax is currently in existence in the United Kingdom, as Fernando just mentioned, and it has not only generated a kind of consumerism in which uh, individuals can purchase low-sugar, healthier alternatives, uh, but has also influenced manufacturers to formulate their ingredients with less sugar in order to avoid uh, the tax. As a result, we, we chose a multi-tier sugar tax because it has the potential to be effective and beneficial to the United States uh, public health. Uh, this implementation would not only affect consumers, but also manufacturers and business owners. And with this, we conclude our policy brief. Thank you. And here are some references. Thank you very much, everyone. Appreciate it.